I'd like to outline in these brief remarks why advanced energy efficiency is an extraordinary new source of competitive advantage, no matter what sort of business you're in. This starts to emerge <clears throat> also from some work by McKinsey. They looked recently at what you save or what you spend in euros to abate a ton of carbon dioxide or equivalent greenhouse gas emissions in the world by 2030. And they found that you could abate about 46% uh, of the business's usual emissions at an average cost of just two euros a ton because this area almost equals this area. In fact, for the U.S., it's greater. Uh, so the cost goes negative. And it's quite a conservative assessment. Basically, you save more money on efficiency in the U.S., for example, than you would pay for the stuff that you do have to pay extra for. And the, <clears throat> that's without applying a lot of the new design techniques and technologies I'll mention, which would tilt the balance even more towards very profitable efficiency. In their theoretical world, we're always bound to diminishing returns. The more energy you save, the more and more steeply the cost of the next unit of savings goes up until it becomes too costly and you have to stop. And some components behave that way. For example, the engineering physics of insulation looks like this. There are also components that do not behave like this. Where you can make the diminishing returns idea definitely untrue is where you combine components into systems. If I add more and more insulation to my house, I can even go past the point of supposed cost effectiveness, just looking at saved heating energy. But then I get to the point where I no longer require furnace, ducts, fans, pipes, pumps, wires, controls, fuel supply arrangements, whose total capex is more than I paid to get rid of them, $1,100 US more. So actually, I save that capex saving 99% of my space heating energy. The big saving is cheaper than if I'd set out to save little or nothing. And why should I get there the long way round when by design I can tunnel directly through the cost barrier to that destination? Asking from the beginning, is there some sensible way to design this house so it won't need heat? And it turns out there generally is. And the same as we'll see for cooling. Now there are two ways to tunnel through the cost barrier. The most obvious is to get multiple benefits from single expenditures. So in this case, I was getting rid of an OPEX and a CAPEX. That's two benefits. But actually, the super windows, as I'll describe, have 10 different benefits, not just one. Premium motors and good dimmable electronic lighting ballasts have 18 benefits, not just one. The arch that holds up the middle of my house has 12 different functions, but I only pay for it once. In fact, there's hardly any component in my house that doesn't do at least three things. That's a good rule of thumb to see if you're getting it right on integrative design. In the front of a Lotus Elise automobile, there's a component that has seven functions but one cost. This is the way nature designs things. Nature never does just one thing. And it's a great deal more fun to design this way and come up with how many things can you make this part or this cost work for you. Now... <clears throat> Let me illustrate the effect. In a typical small office in Denver, Colorado, perhaps the architect does a standard design and then the developer says, well, actually, let's see if we can make this a bit greener. Can you come up with ways to save some energy? And we call this sort of the 50 stupid things approach. That is, the architect will come back with a little list of, well, yes, I could spend an extra $4,900 and save you 1560 a year in cost by doing daylighting, it's a three-year payback, and so on. So the developer looks at the list and says, sorry, business is hard this year. I can only do one-year paybacks, so I guess we can't do any of this. Too bad. But actually, something got missed, because actually, if you do all of these things, you save $18,000 worth of HVAC capacity, and you can also save some on the glazings by putting them in the right place. So by doing everything on the list, none of which was individually yielding a one-year payback, you can get a one-year payback on everything together because almost all of the added capex is offset by the capex reductions that you get as a result of saving 70% of the energy. You only see that if you look at the building as a system. Or here's a big building example in a cold place in North Dakota, $160,000 HVAC capex savings 
resulting in a total CapEx saving of 36,000 U.S. dollars in order to save an OPEX of 75,000 a year. And we, we actually observe this generally. My team's designed now over 1,000 buildings, including a third of the world's lead platinum buildings, and it's quite unusual for us to see CapEx go up rather than down. Now, there are two ways to tunnel through the cost barrier. The most obvious is to get multiple benefits from single expenditures. So in this case, I was getting rid of an OPEX and a CAPEX. That's two benefits. But actually, the super windows, as I'll describe, have 10 different benefits, not just one. Premium motors and good dimmable electronic lighting ballasts have 18 benefits, not just one. The arch that holds up the middle of my house has 12 different functions, but I only pay for it once. In fact, there's hardly any component in my house that doesn't do at least three things. That's a good rule of thumb to see if you're getting it right on integrative design. In the front of a Lotus Elise automobile, there's a component that has seven functions but one cost. This is the way nature designs things. Nature never does just one thing. And it's a great deal more fun to design this way and come up with how many things can you make this part or this cost work for you. So far, I've talked about saved OPEX and saved CAPEX, but there's another whole class of benefits that building owners and managers and tenants will be extremely interested in, and it's great for marketing, and that is there are side benefits that are often worth one or two orders of magnitude more than the direct energy savings. For example, we consistently see uh, a, an increase in labor productivity of about 6 to 16 percent in efficient offices where people can see what they're doing, hear themselves think, breathe cleaner air, and feel thermally more comfortable. Uh, <clears throat> we first discovered this effect by accident in 94. It hadn't been looked for because there was a myth taught in business schools about the Hawthorne effect based on an experiment that had never actually occurred and, and was then misinterpreted anyhow. But it's now been well validated in hundreds of studies uh, in businesses where productivity is carefully measured. And in a typical U.S. office, you'd, you'd have to do the SING numbers, uh, we, we paid a few years ago 160 odd times as much for people as for energy, which means if you had a 0.6% gain in labor productivity, it would have the same bottom line effect as eliminating the entire energy bill. But we're not seeing a 0.6% effect. We're seeing a 6 to 16% effect very consistently. So that's a huge win for the competitive advantage of the occupants. We're also finding 20-odd percent faster learning as measured by test scores in well-daylit schools, 40% higher retail sales pressure in well-daylit shops, uh, better production in factories with efficient equipment, fresher food lasting longer in efficient refrigerators. There are now over a thousand peer-reviewed studies showing better clinical outcomes in green efficient hospitals. Uh, and also we're finding supermarkets have better merchandising and better food safety when their cases and lights become efficient. Even in the steel industry, it turned out that, uh, according to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, you could buy twice as much efficiency on the same budget with uh, superior financial returns if you started counting the side benefits of improving the production process as a uh, result of energy efficiency. Here's a little example on the marketing side. We have a chain of supermarkets called Stop and Shop. And Here's a, a light tube that brings light down and then it's bounced out to the sides. You never want to dump daylight into a space. You want to use it to light surfaces. In fact, generally, you should always light surfaces, not volume. And they got a 38% energy saving with a delightful ambiance. And when the CEO saw the slight extra capex, he said, we'll never do that again. We're in a brutal cutthroat business with tiny margins. About a fortnight later, they showed him the per cart sales data. He said, oh, we're going to do that on every store we build. And they are. Uh, <clears throat> actually, Walmart first discovered this effect by accident. I mentioned there are 10 benefits from super windows. And by a super window, 
I mean not just low E glass, but a uh, but but uh, a glazing with several uh, spectrally selective thin films. Typically, we'll use a suspended polyester film that's about 50 microns thick. It's invisible to your eye, and it's coated on both sides with low emissivity films that let light through but reflect heat. They come in about seven different flavors for different climates and different orientations. And then uh, in our latest glazings, we use two such films, each coated to both sides. And the result when you fill it with xenon, before that we used krypton, uh, insulates as well as 14 sheets of glass. In fact, I've got one that also uses two lights of low E glass and it insulates like 19 sheets of glass. Uh, <coughs> so that's been used in a great many applications, and normally if I were to ask you the benefits, you'd say, well, it saves heating energy, maybe cooling energy, but also it saves fan and pump energy, which go as the cube of flow, so there's a disproportionate saving there to deliver the heating or cooling. You get better radiant comfort, which is half your comfort sensation. So if you're on the sunny side of the building, you will not feel you need to be turned on a spit and basted occasionally. Uh, you can downsize or eliminate space cooling and air handling capacity, save capex. And then there are indirect savings in construction costs because, for example, you don't need such big ducts. Maybe you don't need any ducts. Uh, <clears throat> and then the vertical and horizontal space that they occupy. In a cold climate, you wouldn't need perimeter zone heating even in Calgary or Stockholm. Your furnishings will fade less because the films also are very good at blocking hard ultraviolet. You get less noise coming in through the heavy gas insulation, so it's easier to use difficult sites like next to a highway. You don't get uh, condensation and sash rot and so on. Uh, and you can better admit and control the distribution of natural light. Uh, and then the really big gain, as I'll mention later, is in labor productivity because of the better thermal, visual, and acoustic comfort that comes from these other attributes. Uh, nowadays, we actually tune the detailed specification of the super window to each elevation of the building so that we independently control the flow of light and heat from each direction uh, so as to minimize mechanicals, maximize comfort, and simplify controls. There are millions of possibilities, although they're a bit like gears on a mountain bike. They're mainly redundant. Um, now, there's another way to tunnel through the cost barrier, and that is to take advantage of improvements you're making anyway to renew a facade or to renew old mechanicals or to replace something that has uh, CFCs in it. So let me give you as an example a 19,000 square meter curtain wall office building near Chicago, which is very hot and humid in the summer, but also very cold in the winter. And this building was 20 years old, so the glazing edge seals were starting to fail. It happens at that age. You need to reglaze the entire curtain wall. But rather than replacing it with what was there, namely dark double bronze heat absorbing glass plus a, a gray film, that let in only 9% of the light, we found even in the early 90s, we could put in a super window that would let in nearly six times as much daylight, but a tenth less unwanted heat, because it would be essentially perfect in sorting out visible from infrared and letting in light without heat. And we could also reduce the flow of heat and noise by a factor of three or four, the extra US dollar cost would be about $8 per square meter of glass. But then we could add deep daylighting, which can now uh, transfer light throughout the entire floor plate without glare, even in a very big building. You can go 40 or 50 meters if you want. And very efficient lights and plug loads, typically the lighting load will be six or seven watts a square meter connected, but net of dimming and occupancy controls It'll go down to about three watts a square meter if you have modest daylighting and as low as one watt a square meter if you have exceptionally good daylighting. Properly specified office equipment using its power management features in a Class A office runs about two watts a square meter. If you don't take any care in specifying it, it might be around uh, five to seven. 
but altogether, when you put these things in the same building, on the peak hour, you're going to save three quarters of the cooling load. Well, in any case, you need to renovate the old HVAC system uh, because of age and CFCs, but you can now replace it with a new one that's four times smaller and nearly four times more efficient, and because it's so small, it's 200,000 US dollars cheaper than renovating the big old one, and that turns out to be enough to pay the extra cost of the super windows, the lighting retrofit, the daylighting retrofit, and you end up saving three quarters of the energy with a payback of minus five months. In other words, it's slightly cheaper than the regular 20-year renovation that saves nothing. It's going to take us a few decades anyway to retrofit all our buildings for super efficiency, so why don't we do it in coordination with these other improvements we're making anyhow? You might wonder whether certified green buildings cost more. There's a lot of speculation about this. Most people here assume that your platinum rating will add something close to, you know, 4 to 8 percent of price. Well, actually, we had 33 diverse lead buildings in California over the past decade. The average cost premium was 1.84 percent. It was zero for five of the projects. It was negative for some. And actually, most of the 1.8 percent was, was the uh, paperwork of certification. The average benefits in any event were 12 to 16 times greater than the CapEx premium, so the ROIs were about 25 to 40 percent a year, three-year payback at the old energy prices. And they were not yet tunneling through the cost barrier. They were stuck on the uphill side of the curve, as I think your uh, platinum buildings generally are, because they only saved about 30 percent of the energy. Now, there's a more recent study by a firm that specializes in analyzing real estate economics, and they looked at 45 buildings seeking LEED certification compared with 93 uh, matched pairs um, that were normalized all for time and location. And here's the distribution of cost, where blue are the non-LEED buildings and the green, silver, and gold are those buildings seeking respectively bronze, silver, and gold or platinum. And you notice they're all mixed in together. It isn't like you've got uh, the non-lead buildings at the cheap end and the lead platinums and golds up at the dear end. In fact, there was no statistically significant correlation whatever between lead status and construction cost, whether in general or for specific building types. Um, when I saw this, I became suspicious from our own practice, because we've helped design about a third of the world's lead platinum buildings, that it would turn out that, that really any cost correlation is to do with the experience of the designers rather than the nature of the building uh, certification. And that's exactly how the data are now coming in. If you're paying a premium, it means you're paying for your designer's education rather than green costs more. And indeed, in a good Class A office, as I showed in the benchmark, we normally expect to save 80 or 90 percent of the energy and 3 to 5 percent of the capex.